Yes. So it seems that about the start time, it seems that the website said the wrong time somewhere. Uh huh. Okay. Well, it's eight thirty and nine thirty where we are, so it's the proper starting time or the time we expect. Who knows about proper? So welcome everyone. So this is what we call a research software hour, where we get up here and we talk about well, research software, just like what it says. And the point is to basically like, so show the spirit of, or our spirit of how we do our work with software and computers and so on. Because you learn a lot of stuff from other people. And if you don't have people you work with, then it can be really hard to learn. So, so welcome from me. Uh, also, if we have new uh, new watchers today, uh, we are streaming from Helsinki and from Tromso, mm -hmm. and talking not only about resource software engineering, but also from time to time, high performance computing, uh, Unix shell, shell. Mm -hmm. And um, today, we so we are trying different formats and I think we want to try sessions. So this is session number nine, I think. Mm -hmm. So we want to try sessions where we pair program or sessions where we go into specific topics, a little bit more technical. Mm -hmm. Today, we want to try something different. Today, we wanted to talk about very general topics that are for all of us, like everyday topics that we all do or need to do. And we will talk about how do we how do we organize our projects? And what? how do our setups look like? Mm -hmm. Operating system, editors, what kind of tools do we use? How do we keep track of things? And um, we are not experts in any of that. Uh, yeah. And that we, would, we hope that we get a lot of like input and questions and that we can share how we all uh, deal with these everyday yeah. I'm hoping, challenges. I'm hoping to get inspired to fix a few of the problems I know of. But we will see. So, should we? And, yes, and before we start, um, yeah, we, I really want to encourage questions and comments, and they can come. You can use either the HackMD, uh, which is linked from the Twitch page, and there you can, on top left, there is a pen edit button, so you can you, any anybody can edit this page. You can give comments and questions there, or we we are Twitch chat. And we will try to watch these. And it would be really great to to get some nice discussion going. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us your best ideas about these things. And tell us why we're wrong too. I'm that's the best kind of feedback to get. Yeah, maybe we can serve as a bad example in some of these topics that we will talk about. <laughs> yeah. I've got some bad examples. So um how should we do this? I guess, do we have our list here and sort of go through it and we don't really need to share a screen right now, I guess. Yeah, or... let's start, maybe let's start like that. We will talk a bit. Maybe later, if we want to show something, we can take the screen share and show. Yeah. And maybe we can start with uh, talking about uh, our workflow for starting new projects. Yeah. And I also wanted to say that big thanks to Enrico who suggested this topic for today, which is, I think, of hopefully interesting to, to many. So the question that Enrico asked was, the, well, let's show us your workflow. Like, how do you start a new resource software engineering project? Like, what do you do? How do you organize your folders? Yeah. Do you start with Git or do you, like, what, what is the structure? How do you, how do you use your calendar? Mm -hmm. And how do you track your tasks? Do you use Trello or some time tracking, project management tools? Where do you take notes? Yeah. And how do you write reports and papers? So these are things that we all do, and we we thought it would be fun to discuss how we yeah and did it and how how we changed things yeah. over time. Yeah. So Radovan, how do you start a project these days? Oh uh, yeah. So these days it often starts with um, it starts often with a discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, so if several people are involved, then we often start with uh, talking over video and taking notes. 
the notes we often take on HackMD. So this is also the tool that we use here. So I, mm -hmm. I use that mm -hmm. quite a lot these days just to hash down, I mean, to write down some some points and some ideas or it yeah. sometimes use Google Doc. Mm -hmm. And then what I try to do, often the projects that I start often are Git, Git projects. Mm -hmm. And I often put them on GitHub or GitLab. Yeah. And then what I try to do is after we have this discussion and after we wrote these collaborative notes to distill these into issues mm -hmm. and to make these issues public. So then I don't lose them. So then they are close to the project yeah. and, and they're, they're public on GitHub, I guess. Yes. Yeah. I've seen you do that on some projects. Like I tend to not make so many issues and hope that I remember, but that doesn't, well, yeah. that stuff gets lost. Yeah, because two motivations so to not lose it and the second motivation is to also like maybe somebody sees this this repository and then at least sees what is it that we want to do mm -hmm. it communicates a bit of like intent roadmap maybe somebody will come can come in and actually help us with one of these issues mm -hmm. one one challenge is that so i have projects that often gravitate towards these are git github gitlab projects mm -hmm. so and then I, tr I like to track ideas close to those, mm -hmm. but then I can maybe lose overview over. So if, if there are 20 different Git projects, then mm -hmm. I can forget that I have these issues over there. Yeah. And then the, the really important ones I track somewhere else. Oh, I don't know if you want to talk about it later, but how do you start projects so these days? Yeah. And how did you start in the past maybe? Yeah. So these days I have on all of my computers in my home directory, a Git folder. So I'll usually seed it there and then make a new directory with some unique name. And then that will be where it starts. So usually there's no notes or issues or something like that. I guess mine, at least it seems mine tend to be more solitary or at least one person starts them. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if there are notes, I'll put them in the Git repository. So it used to be not everything was there. Like now, basically everything new I do is within the Git directory. Mm -hmm. But it used to be we'd be spread out over a project directory, which was designed for bigger data that wasn't in Git, or like there'd be a scratch directory and a projects directory on our cluster which have different purposes, so it might be started there. But now, well, everything's small enough that it's synchronized only by Git, which makes things a little bit more simpler. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then and I see a... Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I just said, uh, so, uh, yeah, comment coming in via HackMD. So there is something called octobox.io yeah. that is, uh, that I didn't know, um, to track mm -hmm. issues across GitHub repositories. Another option is GitHub projects. Yeah. Oh, I use actually, I write things like the, I write the things that I really need to do. Mm -hmm. I write it on paper. Yeah. I have some sticky notes on my monitors, but like everything I tend to forget them. Mm -hmm. Actually, I tell people that my task is like a first in last out queue. So basically, if I don't do it right away, chances are I'm forgetting it until the deadline becomes new, due and I get reminded mm -hmm. again, which really should be improved some, I think. Mm -hmm. um, now I've got a thing. So there is Crypt Drive, which is like HackMD and Google Drive, but everything is supposed to be client-side encrypted only. Was that CryptPad? Crypt, oh, yeah, CryptPad, yeah. yeah. Was it CryptPad? I think it was CryptPad. Crypt and sure. there's a, yeah, CryptPad.fr. Um, and in there, there's a Kanban uh, module. So I've started trying to add stuff to the to-do there and then transfer it over when it becomes urgent and when it needs to be done. But for all of these things, the problem is I don't look at them often enough. I guess one thing I have been looking at is GitHub pull requests. Um, like there's something that feels good about closing a pull request. Yeah. And um, 
let's see. So I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, that's a really nice solution that I learned from you to keep overview over all the pull requests belonging to a certain organization. Yeah. So within GitHub, there's this pull request thing. So now the screen is really black. Oh, um, hmm. Maybe my screen share has not been set up. Just a minute. So what I do with pull requests is there we go. You know, I collect all the emails that are pull requests, but this only works yeah. for repositories that I'm actively watching. Mm -hmm. But your solution is really nice for yeah. In general. So here I can look at say code refinery. Alto ski comp, Alto RSE. And then I get, get a list of all the open pull requests there. So lately I've been hovering on this page and I leave it open. Well, actually I can remove not me as an author. So I hover on this page and see things which need action. And then I um, will review it and merge it. And that sort of keeps things flowing pretty well, um, as long as everything's a pull request, which isn't always the case, but at least here it has been. And what um, do you do differently today in terms of starting a project compared to, let's say, 10 years ago? Mm, what would be the main difference? Yeah, I guess 10 years ago, I would always start by thinking, where do I want this project to be? Is it on? my computer? Is it on the cluster? Is it on like the cluster's scratch data directory or the cluster home directory or whatever? Now it's everything tends to be smaller without so many data files. So everything goes into uh, Git and then gets synced to GitHub right away. Mm -hmm. Also stuff is not on my personal GitHub space, but everything goes into a group directory, either for work or one of the informal teams I'm part of. And that way I know that there's will be someone to take care of it after I'm no longer interested. Yeah. Yeah. I have also like when I did PhD and studies, I everything was on my computer and on a cluster somewhere. Mm -hmm. And and only over time I learned how important it is to think about like the lottery factor. What if mm -hmm. what if I win a little lottery and yeah. Uh, leave tomorrow to the Caribbean. So, so <laughs> yeah. who will find the data and who will yeah. understand it? And and today I'm more on the receiving side. <laughs> I'm very concerned about it to yeah. to, know, to know where things are, proper naming, that it doesn't depend only on one person. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the importance of the README file and everything. I guess also in some ways, if as long as everything is self-contained in one directory that's in Git or somewhere, then it's a bit a lot easier than if it was spread out everywhere. Yes. And maybe we can talk about how do we organize our directories folders files? How do we start out? And maybe a related question is we have a question on HackMD. How do how do we keep overview over so there is a Python module? Mm -hmm. With lots of lots of functions, and uh, yeah. how to keep track of that? How to keep an overview? What functions yeah. exist? How do you organize functions inside a module? Hmm. I don't know what it is now, or yeah. we come to it later. But we appreciate the question. Let's answer it now, or at least I can answer it easily now. Which is, I don't know. I just sort of know what's in there, and um... yeah. So the, I also don't have a super answer, but what I will try yeah. would be. With Sphinx, I would automatically generate an overview of all functions. Mm -hmm. So I can automatically generate a reference documentation. Yeah. Like using the, other... the API docs? Yes. Mm -hmm. The other tip is that I think if it if I don't remember anymore where a function, like if it gets too hard to give overview, maybe it can indicate that the module is too large. Mm. So it could indicate yeah. that I need to split up the modules to so that I know more or less immediately where the function is. Mm -hmm. But of course, that works for my project. If you if you work on somebody yeah. else's project, then uh, you want to get an overview and you didn't yeah. design it, and that can be good maybe to do an API reference. Yeah. 
Now, I've never been able to use, successfully use Sphinx API doc. I think I set it up on one project sometime long yep. ago, but it was never really used for anything and I haven't really gotten the spirit of it. So that might be a neat yeah. way to do it. I have. I would not be able to set it up just like that uh, without looking it up. I have done it personally. I I go in and I do Git grab, so I yeah. put things in. A, so that's that's my workflow. Yeah. I, I normally really look through like a website API reference for my own project. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a uh, question: Has anyone used GitHub projects? And yeah, I've used them for some things. The problem is I never, like, I'll use them for a week or two and then forget to keep checking them because there's too many different things going on and it's yeah. no longer first in the queue and it gets forgotten, so. Yeah, we use it in the Code Refinery project and then you you can also sort things into ideas to do in progress done and you can move issues like on a Kanban board, but. But also my experience is that it's a little bit out of sight and I forget about it. Mm -hmm. Somehow the issues are more, they are closer to my actual work. Yeah. But how do you start, uh, so Richard, how do you organize a project when you like mm -hmm. folders and, and, and files? How do you solve that? These days tend to be, things tend to be either code or Sphinx documentation projects. So it's pretty obvious how it's arranged like it's nothing really too fancy like there's at least a license file and usually a readme but like i don't put too much effort into organizing stuff when i did um papers and research i'd make a new directory and then i would make a code subdirectory and a doc subdirectory for papers and a data subdirectory for initial data and sometimes a processed or scratch directory for intermediate data and then sort of um, put stuff um, put stuff in the right places in there but yeah these days iterative I'd say so two things that I often start with are oh, readme readme file mm -hmm. And a license file. I do that really early in a project. One of the first things I add, and often I start with git init to initialize a git repository, even if I'm not really sure whether I want to put it anywhere on GitHub, GitLab, but so that I can go back. And the license is really important for me. Yeah. Because when you start a project, it's easy to change a license later when it's many people and lots of additions, it can be more complicated. Yeah. And I tend to be more organized on Git and GitHub than on my own hard drive. So on, on, the, on my own hard drive, the mm -hmm. folders mm -hmm. they are getting chaotic over time. Yeah. And then from time to time, I'm it's getting so chaotic that I'm, I decide to copy everything to a backup and I reinstall the <laughs> operating system. Then it starts really nice and <laughs> until the next uh, deadline. Yeah. And then do you only restore the stuff that you actually need right now? And yeah, I do. You... I put all the code, the co all the code is anyway somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So the code I can use any day. Mm -hmm. The configuration is saved somewhere else. We will talk about it later. Mm -hmm. And then I keep like all the messy stuff is then all the backup. And then the next few days I realized that I need this and I need that and the other. Mm -hmm. It's only very few things. And then I realized that most of the things that I created, I really don't need mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until yeah. until halfway later. Yeah. Actually, I did reinstall my computer from scratch a few years ago. But before that, for maybe almost 10 years or so, I would keep incrementally upgrading and kept my home directory and all of that stuff there. Mm -hmm. And it got pretty messy. <laughs> so... This idea of like wiping everything or backing everything up and starting clean would like maybe I would consider that. It also it, trains me. It trains me to design good backup for my configuration files and mm -hmm. trains me to keep 
all the important stuff somewhere. Yeah. Typically these days it's the public web. Yeah. And it must separate, you have to separate the stuff that can't be backed up from that, which can be. Mm -hmm. Like basically keep all the big data files and video files and pictures and all that kind of stuff somewhere yeah. separate. Yeah, actually, whenever I have one of my pieces of advice that I've told some people, when starting a project, the most important thing is to sort your data early. So if you sort your data by type, like stuff that's confidential from stuff that eventually can be opened, the big files which um, should not be in Git from the small things that can, as long as you sort these somehow at the top level, you can deal with it later. But if you don't, then eventually you get a huge problem. So think about if you need to open your data. Um, if you can yeah, mm -hmm. um, And I guess that's maybe also why I try to open it as soon as possible and put it on GitHub. Because then, then it's clear to, clear to everybody that this thing is already public. Mm -hmm. And it was really good advice. And I'm not sure whether you gave the advice or maybe Enrico, but uh, to to prepare to make it possible so that it can it can become public at some point mm -hmm. because many projects do at some point yeah and it's good to keep that in mind because already when we do commits and when we add files mm -hmm. it's also uh, a concerns license and um, how do we discuss about things on mm -hmm. pull requests and issues so even yeah. though it may be private today but it may become public at some point yeah it's good to good to keep it in mind that was really good advice do you see the question on twitch chat do you do mentorska folders and i guess that means putting different types of folders inside of other folders um mm. yeah. yeah so this nested directories so and this is sort of a story from my past there's some file which I think I made around 2007 or 2008, I would like to find. It's a make file where I completely automated a certain research project. And it's probably been backed up into a tar file, which itself has been backed up into another tar file because it was in a directory for something else. So basically I haven't been able to search all my, like. If it was just in a tar file, I could look for the ones that looked relevant, list them, and probably find it. But since it's in a tar file, in a tar file, I just haven't gotten around to searching all of them. So I'm pretty sure I have it somewhere, but it's lost. I would say always organize stuff at the top level only and don't have subdirectories. And I think part of that is determining a name for everything. So when I start a project, one of the most significant questions is what's the name? So it should be a name that I've never used before. Like data is not the name of a project. Data is a subdirectory in a project. It could be like um, RSH data or something underscore data, whatever. But the name should be unique. And on every computer that has a directory with that name, it should refer to the same thing. So I admit that I've already categorized projects by folders and names. So many different parameters, and then I get many, many files. Mm -hmm. I can also say that now working at High Performance Computing Center, we have users who generate millions of files, and it <laughs> creates problems. But really, hundreds of thousands of files, and uh, it, it's, it can be problematic for the file system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that can be a limitation. Yeah. We have the same problem here. And actually, that would be a great thing to invite someone to talk about, or we can mm -hmm. talk about that. Um, yeah. How do you, uh, can I ask you, how do you write reports and papers? Hmm. I guess usually I'll start in HackMD and it might go into a Git repository at some point. It might go directly onto a pub, our public Sphinx web page, and I'll draft it there via Git pull request. And then um, mm -hmm. I will 
uh, also Google Drive a lot. So we have some shared, you know, they're called team drives now, which are shared among our teams, which are a pretty good way to solve the ownership problem. What about you? How do you write stuff? I have to admit, I don't really use LaTeX much, much anymore for anything. Yeah, also here, not much less than I used to. I still like it. So when I use LaTeX these days, it's either on in the cloud, uh, mm -hmm. because I got a bit tired of installing everything. So I either use services like Overleaf, or I use a Docker container with <laughs> LaTeX. Uh, and then I, because I, this thing is not really, I, I, it doesn't have yeah. to change. So I use a sing, I have a singularity container for whenever I need to compile a tech, but reports these days, HackMD often. I like that on HackMD, I don't overthink the formatting because there is not much to, there is not much flexibility. I like it. Already when I'm on Google Doc, I'm already thinking a little bit too much how to format it. Mm -hmm. But there I also like the collaborative. Yeah. So it's very often, it's HackMD, Google, Doc, Google Drive, mm -hmm. GitHub. Yeah. Days, sometimes Latic. Like these days is basically if it's not in a collaborative place that can be simultaneously edited, it doesn't exist. Like if I can't share a link and say please contribute here, then like what's the yeah. point of trying? Overleaf yeah. is great. Yeah. yeah. Also seeing your comments on Twitch because what is really nice is that you can then share it with somebody who may not doesn't even have to know really how LaTeX works mm -hmm. and doesn't have to compile anything locally and really can contribute. Yeah. Yeah. If I still did papers, I would probably be doing Overleaf a lot. Mm -hmm. Although if it was just me, I would do it in Git locally, but other people for collaborating yeah. Overleaf is just necessary. Yes, huh? but you can use both. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So. Yeah, you can get the clone. Definitely do that. So how about mm -hmm. on next on the line, we should talk about to-do lists, notes, mm. time tracking. Yeah. Time tracking, I'd be really interested in your opinions about. So how fine grained do you have to track your time? And mm, does this help you to manage stuff? Uh, and that's a question to me, right? Yes. Or to the audience? Well, uh, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> So I've used for a while, I've used tools where which where I can click like, I have different topics and I can click start and end. Mm -hmm. And it gives me a, like a, at the end of the week, it gives me a summary. Yeah. I need to do some time tracking because I work also on projects where I need to mm -hmm. send some invoice to somebody mm -hmm. with how many hours. Uh, what I do these days is I track my work on a like half day granularity. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I write on paper uh, two, three things that I was working on. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the month or at the end of the quarter, I can sum these things up. So that's what I do. Yeah. I thought, so, but they, it can be interesting, not only for the reporting, but it can be also nice for me to know what did I actually spend time on because it can feel, I can feel really busy, but, but then what did I really, really spend the time on? Yeah, like that's sort of what I'm thinking. I don't follow it through, like I, then I didn't keep it up really to have it really detailed. Mm -hmm. How do you do it? So I don't really track my time that much or really plan my time. It seems that I constantly have these things coming in um, all the time. So I'm putting out fires and well, it keeps me happy, but I do get this feeling, what did I accomplish at the end of the day? So, mm -hmm. but I don't know if that's, like some people need to be that way to handle the urgent things and to allow some other people to um, focus on things or what. I guess when we start our research software engineer program shortly, they'll need to track time and that will lead to a big discussion of good ways to do things. One idea, has anyone used the GitHub, no, GitLab time tracking feature? So you can do slash estimate and slash spend as commands. And then you can um, 
comment this in an issue and it will track who spends how much time on something. Yeah, I will be interested to know. I, I admit that I have not used it. I've seen it, but haven't tried it. Yeah. And also a good way to do it that's open source and distributed and um, ideally you can get good reports out of and isn't locked mm -hmm. into some sort of um, website or the other. Yeah, and also I see on the Twitch org mode, alt clock. So this is, yeah. I've seen colleagues use it. So how does I think it can be work? I think it's somewhere in, yeah. is it an Emacs, Emacs thing? I'm, I'm not sure. So if we talk later about editors, you will realize that I'm I'm a Vim person, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Clocking commands, interesting, yeah. There was one more question that you wrote down, just what is talking about projects. And that was, mm -hmm. uh, what do you do when you work with somebody who does not follow a plan. I mean, well, who, maybe who doesn't want to use these tools that you like? Yeah. Uh, how do you how do you deal with that? <laughs> I mean, it happens. Like if they don't use any Git at all, well, I really don't know. I answer questions when they ask for something and hope for the best and hope there's no disasters I have to deal with. Um, yeah, but... also, of course, every project likes different tools. Mm -hmm. So uh, it can be, for people who are in many projects, it can be difficult to yeah. jump between all these tools. But what if you work with somebody very, very, very senior who mm -hmm. well, yeah. is not used to Git or command line or anything like that? Yeah. I like this suggestion here, use Git secretly. So I've done that before. So I've had a Git repository with my paper and mm -hmm. I'll make a branch for my advisor. And yes. then I'll mail them a copy and update their branch to the version I mailed and then get it back and commit it and then go from there. And then you can merge it. And I think everybody invents this solution. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you have to work with, well, if you really like Git, but you, the project really, really likes subversion. So then there is Git SVN. Mm -hmm. I have used that to like secretly using Git mm -hmm. with a SVN project. Mm -hmm. I use Pandoc a lot to convert documents. Uh -huh. If somebody really, really likes format A, but I mm -hmm. want to do, I need to work in format B, mm -hmm. I convert with Pandoc between the formats. Yeah. I haven't had too many of these format problems. It's mainly been doing nothing or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. Excel sheets for time tracking. Yeah. Yes, I use that too, actually, for some projects, Excel sheets. Should we talk about our setups, maybe? Sure. Let me see whether we missed any question. Oh, yeah, before we move there, um, what is a Kanban board? Uh, so that is something uh, in you can take, for instance, these sticky notes and arrange them in columns of ideas to do in progress done. And then when an issue moves from like to do to done, you get an overview of where the project is. And there are online tools for that. And mm -hmm. uh, you can have it on GitLab. There is GitHub projects. Trello is an example. Yeah, like the crib pad, right. Kanban board. And also good comment, not all files can be kept with Git. That is really right, because mm -hmm. um, of course we can put in a, doc, uh, a Word document into Git's repository, we can do that. Yeah. But the problem will be that once we want to compare what changed between the first commit and the second commit, we will. One. it will be difficult to see the difference. Yeah. But once I had, I was working on some paper that was written in Word form and it, I secretly kept it in the Git repository and I set up a diff or a diff filter for Git. So whenever I needed to diff it, I could see it. And it opened in LibreOffice and actually worked decently. And I think there may have even been a merge filter for LibreOffice, which could 
connect them together. But mm -hmm. details, I can't, this was, well, more than five years ago, so I don't remember details right now, but like, so like with doc files, if you do have these independent files, what are the options? There's version control or there's having suffixes, suffixes for the version. And version control is still probably a bit better than that, I'd say. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Oh, do you want me to share your screen? Oh, no, I don't. I just pasted so ah, I just pasted definitely. the answer to, okay. to the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about our setups. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what hardware are we using? What operating system? Which shell and why? And which shortcuts? Which editor? Mm -hmm. So who's first? Oh, you are first. <laughs> okay. So my I have a work laptop, which is something old that I haven't been using much lately. It's running Alto University Ubuntu on it, which is nice that they actually provide a official Linux operating system that mostly works. Um, my desktop is a, well, a desktop machine here that I've made myself out of parts and has been slowly upgraded piece by piece. Um, now most of the hardware is new. Sometime in the spring, right before we started the show, I did an upgrade to new AMD hardware. Mm -hmm. It's got something like four hard drives in there managed somehow or the other. The operating system is Debian because Debian Linux, because I've always used Debian and seems like minimal enough. And like, mm -hmm. it doesn't have any anti features and I know how to set it up myself. So, so why Linux? Why Linux? Hmm. Well, I had a friend back in high school that used it and taught me and then I installed it and then at one point I said okay I'll go back to Windows and then I sort of got annoyed at it and I think in the end it's because of the command line interface so basically being able to have this full control and script things I saw as important even back then and by now I think it's just critical like the yeah. ability to script everything and have this shell interface, I couldn't live without. But I also think that Windows, in, like in, in this respect, improved a lot in the last 20 years since I used it last time. Uh, so I also started using Linux in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And nothing since, which means that I'm, I'm very uh, clumsy on anything that is not Linux. I, think, I just don't know where, these things, where everything is, and I don't know how to modify it, but on, on Linux, I know where things are and how to change them. Yeah. There's a good comment that Mac sort of has the best of both worlds, which I think is a good point. And yeah. I guess that's really why Macs are so popular, because you can have the mm. best of both things. Yeah, I'd be really curious to know how, like, the Windows sub, or what's it, Linux subsystem for Windows, or Windows Linux services for Windows or whatever it is works because I hear that it's really good. So I That's think I that, like I wish there could be a good example of this. Anyway, yeah. I mean the open nature is nice too, but that's not necessarily for everyone. What's what shell do you use? Fish, fish shell. So I've been using Bash for a long time. I still use Bash on the cluster. Mm -hmm. I made once the big mistake of configuring my cluster shell to Z shell, <laughs> and then many things broke <laughs> uh, because they are hard coded or somehow assume Bash. So on the cluster, I use Bash. Yeah. On my computer, I went from Bash to Z shell, which I really liked. Mm -hmm. but then I I liked Fish even more. I really liked that it's has very nice auto completion. Mm -hmm. and, and context aware history. So the history depends where, in which folder am I, am I and it will, it will not auto complete to unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Like if I try to do some, if I try to do some operate on a file that doesn't even exist, it will, like the file will be colored red, for instance. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah. For my shell, I use bash. Um, 
good old-fashioned thing. My bash RC file is really long by now, so it would be a bit too much effort to uh, switch to something else. So it says 810 lines long right now. Oh. And there's like all sorts of conditionals there. Like there's one file I manage on my desktop and copy to the cluster and work computers. And there's like on the cluster, do the setup, on work, do this, and so on. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have so, many fewer customizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and this includes lots of aliases for mm -hmm. command shortcuts, all kinds of stuff, which could be a whole show itself somehow, mm -hmm. I guess. I also have implemented this context aware history. Well, not really, but whenever I go into a directory, I have a per directory bash history. So when I change into a, um, let's see, how does the hook actually work? Whenever I change directories, it will save the history from the old directory to, the, to a file underscore bash hist. And then in the new directory, or then reset the history file to the new directory. Oh. Um, so if I want to know what, how did I do something here most recently, I will, well, search that bash history and it's not always there, but oftentimes it is. So that is like, that's been pretty nice. I'd like to improve it so it will automatically reread the history per directory, but I'm worried it might clobber existing stuff somehow mm -hmm. yeah i think the two aliases that i can just mention is that instead of ls i use exa but i still type ls so that i don't have to change my muscle memory but i use there are these nice modern replacements for mm -hmm. ls instead mm -hmm. of cat i use bat instead of find i use fd Instead of grep, I use rip grep. So there are these Rust re-implementations of these classic tools. Yeah. But I use aliases so that I still type the same thing like 20 years ago. Huh. Interesting. Can you how do you keep your uh, configurations? How do you back them up? Hmm. And how do you um, how do you make sure that how do you synchronize them across yeah. computers? So it used to be I would use Unison. So I had a subdirectory um, dot or an RKD directory. And in there, there were subdirectories for things like configuration files, general notes, and so on. And I used Unison, which is a two-way file synchronizer. It uses the rsync protocol, but it remembers what the state of the sides were before. So if you modify one site, it can know which direction it has to be transferred. Mm -hmm. And then um, if it's been modified on both sides, it will let you resolve the conflict somehow. Oh, okay. um, conflicts were very rare. And I think I it would pop me into some other program to resolve it. But anyway, that doesn't matter. But anyway, so I had this one directory and all of my files were in there. And then I would synchronize this with unison across all the different computers like multiple laptops and other servers and so on with one of the servers being the master copy so basically since it was all always being used on these computers i knew that it was always distributed around there but in the last five years or so or three to five years i've stopped using my own personal laptop so much and somehow it stops syncing with the server. So now it's not being synced anymore. So now at least bash RC and git config are being synchronized among different places. But other than that, not really. Um, oh, yes, maybe I can. So the way I do it is much more simpler. Oh, I have used these. There are these dot files, uh, but I I have like a really simplistic way 
uh, I I put my con dot all the dot files dot I don't know dot bash rc mm -hmm. I mean the fish equivalent of it and vim rc I put them on GitHub mm -hmm. and then I have a I don't know if I should screen share but I have a script. Uh, you want me to? Yeah, why not? Okay. So that's that's where I keep it config. So then I clone it to the new, like whenever I reinstall the laptop or I move to a new place, I clone the config and then I have this install script, very yeah. simplistic, and it creates some links. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and it checks some branch out and, and that's it. Yeah. And where is this cloned? Is it cloned to a sub directory of home? Yes. Or... It's under my under my home. Yeah. And then I have over time I modify these settings. But then from time to time, I go into the Git repository. I see what, oh, here we are, CD config. Mm -hmm. Did I change something? Yes, I did. So here I modify something. So from time to time, then I push these changes to GitHub. Mm -hmm. And then I will clone it or pull it in onto the other yeah. computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now I'd like to set up my, um, my home directory to keep its dot files and other things with git sometime mm -hmm. um but i well haven't started that yet and if i used git to replace this unison setup i had that also synced some big files like mm -hmm. my photo collection and other things so straight yeah. up git wouldn't be good for that but git annex might be, so I would like to use that eventually. Yeah, and also there are maybe things that I would not put on public GitHub anyway, like um, SSH configuration mm. details. Mm -hmm. These yeah. currently I keep them, well, I copy them manually, but uh, mm -hmm. there are setups that, yeah. of course I could put it on a private repository. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I hmm. was, my current files, I could set it up as a network where basically it could get push and pull from computer to computer, just like I did before. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a good comment here. Someone has a private repository that's a submodule of the public one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a, a nice idea. That's one of those yes. So yeah. then you can do git clone uh, recursive, mm -hmm. and it will uh, clone both the public and the private. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes, that's good. We have about 12 minutes left. Uh -oh. Let's talk maybe about what editors are we using. And then we can also talk more <laughs> about how do we manage, how do we not forget uh, knowledge and ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, for editors, someone here, what's some useful aliases to have. So oh. when I need to start an editor, I type VI. And VI is alias to Emacs-NW. So, <laughs> so when I start VI, when I run VI and it actually starts VI, I get a little bit annoyed. And this happened because at one point I wanted to start using Emacs, but would forget to type Emacs. So I said, oh, I'll make an alias. And then, well, yeah, VI is shorter than the Emacs. And I don't use the graphical Emacs, but always in the terminal. So this sets it into the terminal mode. Mm -hmm. one, one alias that we both use, and we have mentioned it in an earlier show, is to set up a virtual environment. Mm -hmm. So I have a three character alias to set up a virtual environment, Python virtual environment, and if there is a requirements for text file, then yeah. install it into it. And I'm sure there is a better way to do that, but I find it super, super useful to have this, mm -hmm. this alias here. Another alias that I use a lot is git rename. If I need to rename all instances of one word in my git repository to another one. Mm -hmm. Git rename. So. Aha, uh -huh. so it does, it get grips for the pattern and then. Hmm. Yeah, and then does a set uh, in, in, yeah. an in place uh, replacement. Yeah. 
Is there any kind of bank of these shell aliases that people can contribute to? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Like a community driven mm -hmm. alias. I heard something about that. I saw somebody using it. So, yeah, it must be. I... Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I mean, surely there must be. So, you are using MX? Yes. Not that I'm um, using it very well, but it's my editor. Lately, I've tried to use its package manager and some of the advanced, like Python linting and some of these other things. Like, over the 15 years I've been using it, I've collected some extensions and so on, but I wouldn't mind putting in some time to really learn it really well. Mm -hmm. So I use Vim, BI, mm -hmm. um, and oh, I think at the time when, when I started doing Linux, I think these were the really two only options of really good editors. This, mm -hmm. it, I mean, the question was Emacs or, or BI, mm -hmm. and both can do, well, everything. Mm -hmm. oh, I think these days there are other alternatives. There is, I hear really good things about Visual Studio Code. Right, yeah. So other uh, other editors are getting popular. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's good investment of time to get really, I'm not super good at the editor, but I think it's good investment of time to get reasonably good at your favorite editor. Yeah. Because we do spend quite many hours a day in, in our editors. What about a console versus graphical editor? Like to me, the ability to be able to use the same editor on the cluster remotely within a screen session, the same way I would use it locally, is just something that I don't think I could give up right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. So same here, but, but I'm also just used to it. But many, I think many people don't really have to work on a remote machine and they work on their own laptop and then yeah. I think it's fine to go for something which is not only text, like text text. Yeah. So what about, like, that's a good philosophical question, like, what can we do to reduce the barrier of people who work locally? Like if someone can only use tools well on their local laptop or desktop, then they're at a bit of a disadvantage when you need to run things on the cluster. At least I think that the ability to run stuff, to develop and run in the same place on the cluster is quite useful. So there's got to be some good strategies that make this better. Like for our cluster, we've started making it possible to remote mount those file systems locally. So you could use your own editor to edit files directly on the cluster and then go yes. and run it by SSH. But um, hmm. because it can be really a barrier to, uh, yeah. well, many users are for, in the terminal for the first time and then yeah. now, now you suddenly deal with a text editor and it feels like yeah. traveling back in time 40 years. And only after yeah. quite an investment of time, you realize that, wow, that's actually pretty good because now mm -hmm. I can batch process and I can do certain yeah. things really quickly. Yeah. There's several comments back in the ch chat or in the oh. chat mm -hmm. about um, using different graphical front ends like open on demand or X11 forwarding. At our university, you can use, um, like if you're at home and the X11 forwarding is too slow, you can get a virtual desktop and then SSH from there to the cluster. And that's worked really well for some people to run their programs, their graphical programs on the cluster, but have good performance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there is also a question in the HackMD about the difference between Bash and Satchel, but maybe we can talk about uh, it a little bit yeah. in the session. We have like five minutes left. Mm -hmm. It would be fun to talk also a bit about how do we manage <laughs> ideas that are flying by all the time and uh, posts mm -hmm. and links and how, mm -hmm. how do you 
So <laughs> how do you manage your knowledge? How do you back up ideas? How do you store things to remember? Things, things that you want, codes, articles, yeah. websites that you want to check out later? How do you do it? Well, I have to say probably not very well. Maybe I should work on this more. I have a note.txt file. I'll sometimes put some immediate notes into, but that tends to be more of a write once, read never kind of thing. Um, sometimes I'll open stuff in a browser tab, but I do most of my browsing in private windows. So by the time my browser has to restart, then I lose all of that, which <laughs> maybe is good because it means that like I don't get overloaded with old stuff to look at um hmm. yeah what do you do yeah also browser tabs until I need to close it so then I'm and I hope it doesn't crash so then I have to move it somewhere else I mm -hmm. more and more hack MD also for my personal use so if I have an idea I write it down or if if there is already a git Repository, I open an issue, even for a single person. So for my own, even for my home page, if I have an idea, mm. I write it out there. Mm -hmm. um, more and more Jupyter notebooks, mm. um, readme's. For uh, if some, if I get recommendations for like books, videos, podcasts, I have different lists for these so that I don't forget that. Uh, on my home page, I have a list of like links, and these are mostly links that I wanted to not lose. Uh -huh. so, that's a good idea. And also so things, makes you look really professional too, because you have all these like yeah. things. So I guess that means you haven't actually read all of these and know everything in them. That's right. Some of them I haven't read yet, but I think they are worth reading um, mm -hmm. by myself in future. I use GitHub these gists for small things. Mm -hmm. So this can be a, like just for a script, maybe it's too heavy way to open a Git repository. Then I yeah. save it as gist. Constantly, I'm trying to lift ideas and knowledge that fly by in an email or chat, because my, I mean my inbox is really a mess, and I will. So I try to things to follow up. I try to lift them to some other document, yeah. make it findable. Yeah. When I find a nice solution to something, I cr I like to create like a demo mm -hmm. repository, Git repository, just for myself. Like, how do I solve this and that? Mm -hmm. And so curiously, it. Yeah, sometimes it can be useful for others. Yeah. Sometimes I would start a project directory immediately and then hope I'll get back to it someday, but it doesn't always happen. Oh. Do you have a problem? You get too many ideas coming in, so if you kept track of all of them, the list would grow indefinitely and become not useful. Or yeah, something. I'm thinking about it often. And there are so many interesting things happening. Also now in the online age, there are so many um, conferences and mm. things that one could watch and all these videos, and it can be really overwhelming. Yeah. So there needs to be also some filtering. There are there are interesting things where I have to just tell myself, no, I will not <laughs> put it on my list because otherwise it, I will get totally overwhelmed. Yeah. I started to do this today I learned. So I have a Git repository where I keep mm. Mm -hmm. just super short things that I learned for my yeah. future forgetful self. Um, at least I open an issue there. I want to write more blog posts, but I have so far written only one or very few, but I want to do more and more of that. Yeah. Huh. Do we need to make a TAL federation somehow? So like, I'm not sure if I would want to start my own TIL. Like maybe yeah, I would, can. but you know. Hey, we can make a like, common, common thing. Yeah, I can move my mind somewhere and then we can go from there. Yeah. But I found it useful. I look it up often. I go, I look, ah. it's very often I look up my own TIL mm -hmm. for links or how did I, how was oh. it again with the Twitter cards? I, yeah. I looked it up very often. Mm -hmm. One thing I did was I started a Git repository called Templates, which isn't a good name because that is, well, because that doesn't match my previous naming standards of something that would be unique across all directories. But anyway, like I would put in things like a model setup.py file or the kinds of stuff that I would copy. So that's 
not quite the same thing, but mm -hmm. yeah. I see also on on the Twitch chat using the good old paper, mm -hmm. and I use more and more paper also. Mm -hmm. I use Trello and many many different things, mm -hmm. but for my to do list, I use really a notebook. Yeah, because it gives me like crossing it off on a paper feels yeah. a bit more satisfying than just like clicking somewhere. And then once the paper gets too messy, mm -hmm. uh, it forces me to reprioritize yeah. and I can drop some issues. So every two, three days I sit down with a coffee and I reprioritize my to-do mm -hmm. list on mm -hmm. paper. And I can always carry this notebook with me. And sometimes I don't have the laptop, I don't have the phone. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to demonstrate my paper here when things stuck. So yeah, uh -huh. this is my desk paper for taking notes. Okay. Yeah. Not that I use it that often, but I see. I have it here, but mine is like this format. It is like this format. Mm -hmm. papers. Yeah. And different levels of yeah. priority. Mm -hmm. At one point, I used to have a notebook like that, where it was like, like the lab notebook that someone mentioned in the chat. So you would always write at the end, and it's mm -hmm. a record like that, which I think is sort of a useful model. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, actually, at one point, it was oh, years ago, some summer, we had the idea of making a Git utility called, what was it called? We would call it Captain's Log. So there'd be a command line alias where you could enter a note, and it would record it into a Git repository as a message in an empty commit. So it would be a write, write once kind of thing. And you could always append new notes there and search for them and so on. So sort of mm -hmm. like a notebook. I mm -hmm. guess then you can also add, attach files and stuff like that. Um, but nothing has really come of that. And I'm sure it would be a classic case of turn something into a technological problem. And then after you've solved that, you realize it's not actually a technological problem. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. It's complicated and everybody has preferences. And especially when we work in many different projects, mm -hmm. it can get tricky. We are already now more than one hour in. Yeah. So should we look at the remaining questions and then call it a night? Or is there something else to so I think there is really a lot to talk and some of these will spin into separate sessions in future. Mm -hmm. I really liked that we got lots of, there was lots of comments on on the chat and also questions. This is really how I would like it to be more and more. So I'm really happy with, yeah. with today. And the way we did it also in the last sessions is that we can now soon like officially close it, but we can still come back to some of these questions and discuss yeah. a bit. Mm -hmm. I wanted to comment on the Z shell versus bash. Uh, yeah. Uh, There's also and... one thing I'd like to comment on from Twitch mm -hmm. chat. What was okay, that? I'll do that first. So someone says it's way easier to keep a paper or notebook with you, yeah. which like in one sense it is, but also you think in these days it's easy to keep something electronic with you all the time, yeah. or like it's in the cloud, so you can always write to it. But mm. I sort of agree that nothing really seems to work as well as that paper kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. I mean, maybe things like most of these online things are not actually open source or very reusable. So you don't trust it will last that long or have limited interfaces or you need the network connection. and all that kind of stuff. So, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Bash versus ZSH. Do you yeah. want to show us some cool ZSH stuff? Do you want to try to convince me to switch to ZSH? Well, I can convince you to switch to Fish. <laughs> uh, my Z, Z, Z shell is a bit rusty because it's been already a couple of years, but mm -hmm. the motivation why I even a couple of years earlier than switch to Bash to Z shell. What was really nice in Z shell, uh, I think everything that you can do in Z shell, you can also do in Bash. But 
problems like rename all all files by changing the uh, I don't know the, the the prefix of the name mm -hmm. or the suffix of the name. I mean these can, these things can be done in Bash, of course, but it felt it felt a bit more fluid in that shell. Mm -hmm. So mass renames of files. Also problems like remove all files except one mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. folder. Mm -hmm. Like how would you do that in Bash really? Uh, you yeah. would probably copy it some other place, remove everything, copy it back. Mm -hmm. Have you used the program V either? V I D A R. No. So it globs and it opens an editor that lists all the file names in the directory with some index number. And uh -huh. then whatever you rename in that file gets renamed on disk. What gets removed gets removed then. Okay. Like Interesting. Path then adjusted no. then moved. So That's I would sure do something it. like, you want me to demonstrate it? Yeah. So on that shell, this was really nice, and also in these kind of problems. Okay, I am sharing my screen. Yes, mm -hmm. just share. Yes. Now I need a safe directory to do this in. I guess the safest way is to make a new thing. So. I vid the current directory. So it opens my preferred editor, which is Emacs. And now I see the index number and then the file names. So yeah. one, let's say I want to duplicate all of these or remove uh, a file. Okay. I'll remove three. And then I save and then I list and now it's done. Yeah, that's great. Um, I will use this one. <laughs> I think it's in the Debian package called more utils. Hmm. Um, well, anyway, you can easily find it. So yeah, or if I make a subdirectory, will this work? Actually, yes. So I found this is good for managing all of these kind of files. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Control. Oh yeah, control. Yeah, uh, control R. I use it a lot to uh, because what I used to do. So when you have so history is a great command to see your history. But at the beginning, what I used to do was like exclamation mark and the command number, mm -hmm. or exclamation mark and the start of a command. Yeah, actually. and it will run the last command that look that started like that. But it can be really dangerous. Oh, uh, because it, what if you repeat a command which you didn't yeah. want to repeat? Actually, and then control R is much nicer because you, it's a recursive, it's a, yeah. it, you autocomplete thing search through your history. So here, maybe I'll demonstrate here. So mm -hmm. here I've got my shell. I do control R and then I can start typing V I and it goes to the last command that started with that yeah. or say four and it goes to the last command that included. Reverse but, search, super nice. Yeah. And it's great because it works in many other things too. Um, yeah, and someone on Twitch chat said, why not configure your up arrow to behave more sanely? I did that at one point, but then since that wasn't the default, then it wouldn't work in other things transparently. So eventually I just realized that using the default thing, even if it was a bit imperfect, was better overall, at least for my taste. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Also for the overwriting history. So let's say I do LS or, so did he mention these bank commands in bash shell? I'm not sure actually, we ever talked about it now. Actually, this is, I think, perhaps a property of the read line library and not just Bash shell. So it might be applied to other shells too. But anyway, these exclamation mark commands are history substitutions. So exclamation mark dollars means uh, the last line, the last word of the last line. 
insert it here. But I do this, and instead of running immediately, it will make the replacement and then let me verify before I run it again. Yeah. Um, hmm. So, yeah, so I think this, my, I think I had to configure this in bash. Um, let's see. Uh, one of my aliases is L. So if L is on a directory or somewhere, it lists. If L has a file name, it opens less on it. History. And when, when there was this question about mm. what is the same behavior of an up arrow, like what would be in a not, what, what does that mean? Let's see, maybe I can demonstrate it here. Mm. Is this how it's configured? Maybe this is something different. Actually, this is probably something different. Hmm. Okay. So do I is mark, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, that's the whole last line. Yeah. yeah. At one point, I had a sticky note on my monitor that listed some of these history substitutions. Because basically, this exclamation mark dollar sign is the only one I ever use because it's the only one I remember. So I wrote it down, but the note seems to be gone, mm. which I guess is one of the disadvantages of paper. Yeah, that's the one the one thing that doesn't work on fish. So it took me quite a while to unlearn that one. Mm -hmm. oh, the exclamation mark dollar. We are already running quite over time. Mm -hmm. Should we close the session and thank everybody for for watching and for input yeah hopefully hopefully it was fun sure i learned new yeah. tools but so what would you all think about having some sessions that go deep into a certain topic like for example i don't know rust and radovan's been working on it a lot lately so we dedicate a whole session so i install rust compiler or whatever and then I start with my empty screen, and then Radovan walks me through my first Rust project, and I do everything there. Um, so this would go much into, like, much deeper into a certain topic, which may not be as interesting to everyone, but um, like more like geeking out about a certain thing, but also, well, maybe yeah. that's good. I would say let's try. We need to try out different formats and see what works best. Yeah. And I think there will be something for everybody. Yeah. Then over time. Like so far, we've been doing this like several things, but very high level. But maybe we can get more interest yeah. and help more people if we go deep instead of shallow. So the notes from today we will save and attach it on the website. Mm -hmm. um, and. Thanks so much for watching and for questions and input. Yeah. Yeah, and there, we should we should do a session where we talk only about the editor and compare <laughs> shells and tricks yeah. and, or in and or MX and, and other editors. We had this idea of an editor war sometime. So <laughs> VI versus Emacs. And um, <laughs> someone asked, what's the website? Um, it's. I'm screen it, sharing, hopefully. No. It sh no. It should also be in the channel description. Yeah. Um, do you want me to we share your screen? Yeah, okay. Maybe a little tiny, but resource software hour .github .io. And here we will put the notes. Also, we link them the videos we put mm -hmm. we put in on, on, on YouTube. Yeah. And we will then so our ambition is to do this every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. As long as you keep giving us topics. So, yeah, one way to suggest topics is 
Oh, we have this GitHub. Here we have a repository where you can open issue. Oh, where is it? RSH notes. Mm -hmm. That's one way to suggest ideas. And we have already many of them here parked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. OK. Thanks. So see you all next week. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for watching. Bye.